Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of truth and sacrifice, we give thanks for your servant William Alexander Gary, who, like the church's first martyr, gave witness to your liberating gospel and echoed Christ's healing words of forgiveness. May we also seek your truth as we offer ourselves in obedience to the same. All this we ask through him who is forever the bishop and reformer of our souls, Jesus Christ, our Savior. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty for the captive, and the opening of prisoner to those of who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord, of the Lord's Savior, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of, the glad, of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastation. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. The word of the Lord. Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered behind closed doors will be proclaimed from the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that can do nothing more. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. But even the hairs of your head are all counted. Do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you.
They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall repair the ruined cities. I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning. I would like to, to begin this morning with a word of thanks to the Dean and Chapter of the Cathedral, of our Cathedral, uh, for inviting me to preach here this morning. It was a, an unexpected honor. And as I know that probably quite a few of the, the newer, newer members of Grace Church Cathedral might not know me from Adam, uh, I think it will worth be, be worth pointing out that for me this is something of a homecoming. I am the son of Virginia and Doug Donahue, and for most of my childhood my family sat in the third pew on the left. And as some of the older members of Grace uh, would know, I liked to sleep during church usually during the sermons, so it doesn't apply to us. Um, it was from this place and with this congregation that I discerned a call to ministry, and it's in, it's in large part due to the leadership here that I was able to return to this diocese and to begin serving at St. Anne's in Conway, and I want to shout out to all of the folks from St. Anne's who are tuning in to today's service. Um, I hope that you're, you're finding it a, a, wel a welcoming uh, environment for you all and that you're happy to be here. I know I am. As I would like to remind the, the folks of St. Anne's, the name Anne in Hebrew means grace. So I guess you might say that I have gone from grace to grace. In any case, it is good to be back here, so thank you to, to Michael, to Callie, to Caleb, to Bryce, and to all the people of grace for inviting me to be here on this special day of observance and reclamation. I say reclamation because for many years, the memory of our bishop, our eighth bishop of this diocese, Bishop William Alexander Gary, was essentially glossed over and whitewashed. Growing up in this diocese, I never heard Bishop Gary's name mentioned, or if I did, it was just as an historical figure of no particular importance. It was only recently, thanks to the efforts of our Chancellor, Tom Tisdale, that I came to learn more about Bishop Gary's story. And I soon began to understand why Bishop Gary's story was once only whispered about behind closed doors. If you look back, at how Bishop Gary was remembered in this diocese for roughly eight decades after his death in 1928, you'll see that he was remembered as a good bishop, a capable administrator who helped nearly double the size of this diocese during his 20 years as its bishop. You'll see that he was remembered as a faithful servant of the gospel whose academic talents won him respect both within the diocese and within the wider church. You may find it mentioned that Bishop Gary was a progressive and that he believed in what is called the social gospel. You may find that he was devoted to the idea of reconciliation and Christian unity. And you may find that Bishop Gary was instrumental in the founding of Voorhees College and that he tried unsuccessfully to appoint an African-American bishop as a suffragan bishop to serve the African-American churches of this diocese. But you'll also find that when his death is mentioned, all it says is that he, you won't find any mention of the connection between Woodward and Gary. Nor you, will you find anything that suggests that Bishop Gary was a martyr. And if you're wondering why should this be, I suggest it's because that Bishop Gary, like most of the martyrs in their day, was dangerous. And the way we usually deal with the memory of dangerous people is to sanitize their story. We turn them into either mildly virtuous heroes of gentility or eccentric geniuses who wound up being victims of random circumstance. Only rarely do we admit that they are actually people whose example we ought to follow. 
because we know deep down, don't we, that to follow is to court danger. Now, Joseph Herbert Woodward, deranged though he may have been, saw the danger that Bishop Gary posed. In a pamphlet decrying Bishop Gary's plan to introduce an African-American suffragan, Woodward described the attempt as a nefarious scheme against the social order of the South, and that if it succeeded, it would make the angels weep. In one particularly bitter passage, Woodward lamented that Bishop Gary has already shown that he believes in using the church for the reconstruction of society, and he likened Gary's efforts to the threatening movements of a venomous snake. That was what Gary's eventual assassin thought of him. He was a dangerous person. And for far too long in this diocese, Gary's memory was treated as dangerous. Dangerous in that it might cause others to stand what he stood for. Dangerous in that it might cause others to question the way things were. Dangerous in that the people in power might be called to share their power with those once considered unworthy. Dangerous in that it might mean that faithful Christians would have to tear down the structures of oppression and rebuild from the ruins a community based on God's love for all. It's no wonder that it's only recently that we've begun to reclaim Bishop Gary's memory as something truly worthy of remembrance. But here is where Bishop Gary's story meets ours with a renewed demand for us to court danger. To say that Bishop Gary was the perfect champion of justice would be to unnecessarily romanticize him. He was, after all, a man of his own time. He was a southern white man, an aristocrat of sorts, who did benefit from the privileges of his station. And he can be criticized for not being vocal enough or for not being strident enough in his work for equality. But he was willing to court danger, to strive, however imperfectly, to make the world more just, to risk being thought of as an agitator so that people might understand the moral implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ on our life and in our society. And that's where we are. We are in the midst of a moment where we are being asked to consider once again what the gospel means, not just for us personally, but for society as a whole. We are being asked how we can help tear down the structures of power which have oppressed people of color for centuries. We are being asked how we can help rebuild the ruins left to us by those centuries. And there's no guarantee that we'll get it right or that we will be judged by history as having done the best job possible. But, as Bishop Gary's example shows us, we can make an effort, however imperfect it might be. We can court that danger. We can run the risk of dreaming for a better world and then doing something about it. To use the words of the prophet Isaiah, instead of cringing in fear with a faint spirit, we can put on the mantle of praise and be glad that we are alive for such a time as this. But it is dangerous. And it is uncomfortable because it means that in our life of faith, pious platitudes must give way to concrete action. As Bishop Gary himself knew, it's one thing to talk about equality and another to risk your pride by listening to someone whose voice has not been heard. And so I would encourage you all over the coming days and weeks to reach out to someone whose voice you have not truly heard, 
whose story you may not have been aware of. And listen to those stories. You may discover that in hearing those voices, you may hear the gospel demand on your life in a whole new way. You may discover that you have a role to play in repairing the ruined cities. In the words of Bishop Gary, you may discover that our high calling under God is to burn away the barriers which divide us, to allay prejudice, to strengthen the ties which bind brother to brother and section to section, and to make of this land one free people. We believe in one God. Lifting our voices with all creation and all the saints of every time and place, let us offer our prayers to God, saying, In your mercy, hear us, Lord. For the Holy Church of God throughout the world, remembering Michael, our presiding bishop, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Standing Committee of the Diocese of South Carolina, and remembering Voorhees College and the United Church of North India in the Anglican Communion, that the Lord may confirm the church in faith, sustain it in hope, and deepen its communion and charity. In your mercy, for the leaders of all nations and peoples, that there may be mercy, justice, and peace throughout the world. For those who serve in the military, mission, and outreach work, remembering Maxwell, Legree, Evans, Henry, Thomas, Griffith, Dennis, Dan, Keen, Edward, Andrew, Francis, Jake, and Andrew. In your mercy, for this city and every place, for ourselves, our families and companions, and all those we love, in your mercy, for those in danger, those who are hungry and homeless, those who are oppressed or in prison, that the example of the martyrs may give them courage and the help of believers give them hope. In your mercy, we thanks for all the blessings of this life, for the life and witness and martyrdom of William Alexander Gary. In your mercy, for all those who are ill or suffering hardship, for Paula, for Stuart, for Jeff, for William, 
Sandra, Rhett, David, Debbie, Mary, John, Deanna, Sue, LG, Les, Thomas, Randy, Suzanne, Bill, Linda, Donald, Susan, John, and Kirk. In your mercy, for the dying and the dead and all who mourn, remembering Theodore Clyburn, Albert B. Burt, Joseph Robert Horn IV, Lucille Halsey Van Kolnitz, and Edith Tipton. In your mercy. Holy God, mighty God, immortal God, adored by martyrs and praised by the saints, receive the prayers of your holy church and grant them in accordance with your gracious will through Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess the sins of the you, in God's word and deed, by what you have done and by what you have done. We have not only with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we want to repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. All right, well, now is the time for the family focus and the children's focus. Um, you might tell that I, I'm hiding something behind my back, and that's because I want to invite all the children to come down to the TV or the tablet or the phone or whatever you are watching us on today. And I don't want to scare you off too quickly with what I have behind my back. So I'm just going to make sure that you get down here first and you get nice and settled and that you're ready and nice and close to listen. Now, you might have noticed over the past couple of months, children, that you have been eating out a lot less than you used to do and that you've been eating at home a lot more and you might have noticed that mom or dad have been a little bit more stressed over the last couple of months when it comes to lunch time and dinner time possibly more stressed than you've seen them for a long time in your life and that's because cooking and cooking different things and getting variety in our cooking can be quite difficult sometimes it's very easy to pop a pizza in the oven every day and put it in front of you and you gobble it down and you're very happy or to throw some corn dogs or french fries in there and you love those as well. What's really difficult is making sure that you're getting the variety of vegetables in your life. Now don't run off, come back please. Uh, the vegetables are still a long ways away from you. But I can say as one who's cooking quite often these days that getting the right vegetables next to your pizza or to your corn dog or to your french fries can be very difficult. Especially when, after all the cooking, and we throw the vegetables down next to you on the plate, and you kind of give us that look like, oh, why do we have that one today? Now, I highly doubt you like all vegetables. Maybe you have a favorite vegetable. Maybe it's, uh, I've got some mushrooms here. I used half of those last night in a recipe that I did. I've got some green beans here. They're going to be very shortly cooked at home. I've got a cucumber. Maybe that's your favorite. I've got some tomatoes here. Oops, one fell off. Some tomatoes here. Little ones. Maybe that's your favorite. I've got a, if you know what this is, shout it at at home. It's a leek. Uh, this is very good, chopped up and put in some soup or something like that. What else do I have down here? I've got an onion. I would not suggest eating that before it's cooked, but, but there's an onion there as well. And maybe you saw your favorite vegetable in here. Or maybe you didn't see your favorite one. And maybe you wonder, why can't you just have your favorite vegetable all the time? Maybe if that, uh, mushrooms are your favorite, maybe you just want mushrooms only. And that's all you want. Why do we have to have these vegetables? They all look different. They all taste differently. But most importantly, each and every one of them has different vitamins and minerals and nutrients. And you don't need to know what those things are. You just need to know they're good for you. 
And if you ate mushrooms only, you wouldn't get the amazing, awesome stuff in the onion. And I promise there's some good stuff in there. Or if you ate mushrooms only, you wouldn't get the good stuff that's in the tomatoes or the green beans. And so there's this beautiful difference and diversity in all of these vegetables. And the reason that your parents keep serving them to you and making them eat and making you eat them isn't because we like to see your faces scrunch up and so on and so forth. It's because they're good for you. They're really good for you. And if you struggle with your vegetables, don't worry. You can do what my daughters do. You eat the vegetable first so you can wash it down with all the other nice food afterwards. But all of these vegetables are wonderful in the fact that they are different. And they give us such different things. What a boring world it would be if the onion said to all the other vegetables, you guys have to be onions. Try really hard, Mr. Leek. You've got to become an onion before you can go to market and be sold. Instead, we have this beautiful and wonderful difference in the vegetables because it's important for us to have the different things that they bring to us. Now, this vegetable basket is hopefully a very good illustration for who we are as people living together in society together, either in the church or in this city of Charleston, this state of South Carolina, this country of the United States of America, or even this world in which we live, how important it is to know that not only are we different, but our differences are not something to be ashamed of or something to change, but our differences are to be celebrated. And we know this because God made us different. God didn't make us all the same. Like the vegetables, God didn't make us to look the same or to speak in the same way or to act in the same way or to think in the same way. God made us all different. And God didn't make us different so that we could say, well, we've all got to be the same, even though we're different. Or we have to treat people in a, in a worse way because they're different. God made us different and said essentially to us, look at your differences and celebrate those and know that we are knowing something about God in our differences. And of course, the same thing happened when Jesus came, when God sent his son. Jesus didn't say, do you want to follow me? Well, okay, you've got to be exactly like that person. You've got to look exactly like them. And only when that happens can you follow me. Jesus said, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter what you think, follow me. Come and follow me. And Jesus celebrated the differences of the people in his community and called all of them to follow him. And then he told them, now go out and tell everybody what I've said and what I've done for you. Jesus didn't say, just go tell one group of people who I am. He said, tell it to all of the nations. Tell it to everyone. And so today on this Bishop Gary Sunday, and especially what's going on in our communities across our country and the world, we celebrate our differences, knowing that God has made us different so that we can see in each other, in our differences, the beauty and love of God. Amen. Great in the sight of our Lord is the, is the death of his servants. On this Bishop Gary Sunday, we celebrate our patron saint in this diocese, and we strive to live into the example of his martyred life and witness. We celebrate him as bishop, as reformer, and as martyr. And so as we're celebrating one of our own, Bishop Gary, it seemed appropriate that we would bring one of our own back to the pulpit of Grace Church Cathedral. Rob, thank you uh, for your presence, for a, a superb message that not only speaks of Bishop Gary in history, but allows us to enter into that history today by living into the life, uh, the witness, the sacrifice of Bishop Gary. On this Sunday, we also want to honor uh, those in our diocese, uh, those in our community, who are, through their own lives, have lived into the life of Bishop Gary and have modeled for us what he modeled for us. It is our joy today to honor another one of our own as I invite Mr. Lonnie Hamilton III to come forward to receive the Bishop Gary Medal for this year 
2020. As Mr. Hamilton makes his way to the chancel steps, I want to remind all of us what he represents. Now, you might wonder, why do we recognize some people? Well, we need examples. Would you not agree today, in this world, we need models in our lives? I, I think we need giants. And someone would say, well, why do you need giants? Well, we need people to look up to. Well, Lonnie Hamilton III is a giant in our community and in our church. And we need his example to remind us what all of us are called to. So we're honoring him, but what we're saying is, in honoring him, let's, like Lonnie has done, enter into that life of service. So let me share this with you now. Uh, it, was a it was in 2017 that we established an award given in honor of the eighth bishop of the Diocese of South Carolina, the Right Reverend William Alexander Gary, bishop, reformer, and martyr. The award is presented annually to an individual who best exemplifies the spirit of sacrifice that Bishop Gary modeled in his life and witness as the Bishop of South Carolina from 1908 to 1928. And as you know, a chapel of Grace Church Cathedral is named for our martyred bishop. On June the 28th, 2020, the Bishop Gary Medal is presented to Mr. Lonnie Hamilton III. Lonnie's faithfulness to his parish of Calvary in Charleston as well as his courageous leadership in the Diocese of South Carolina, has given us a cause for hope and a future to work toward. His civic leadership with a commitment to justice through education reveals his vital role in community life as icon, model, and mentor for all whom he has encountered. And we say this day, well done, good and faithful servant. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all your saints, who have been the chosen vessels of your grace and the lights of the world in their generation. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. In these last days you send him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. The night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine, we pray, O gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit in the fullness of time. Reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Stephen, blessed Alban, Blessed William Alexander Gary and all your saints, who may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by him, and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory.
gifts of God for the people of God.
eternal God, Heavenly Father. You have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us the spiritual food in the sacrament of the body and blood. Send us now to the world of peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and sinless of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven. To enter that gate and dwell in that house, where there shall be no darkness, nor dazzling, but one equal light. No noise, nor silence, but one equal music. No fears, nor hopes, but one equal possession. No ends, nor beginnings, but one equal eternity. In the habitation of thy glory and dominion. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. <laughs>